Welcome to Studio Visits with Silver Eye, where I get to talk in depth with some of the most interesting contemporary photographers working today. I'm David Oresik, the Executive Director of Silver Eye Center for Photography. You can visit us online at silvereye.org to learn more about our exhibitions and programs. In this episode, I spoke with Fellowship 20's Keystone Award winner, Eric Hagen. Eric is an artist based near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. His work explores the physical and psychological landscapes of low-wage service workers through personal documentary, stage photographs, and narrative text. Hagen received his MFA from the University of Hartford. This interview was special for me because his award-winning project, which is titled Team Member, focuses on his day job in a grocery store, and I also worked in a grocery store for several years in college. In this conversation, we talk about how his photographs can tell the stories of people working in the service industry, how COVID-19 has changed his project and his job, and how one can retain their humanity when they are caught between the ravenous desires of a giant corporation and an endless stream of customers. Team Member will open in our gallery in February of 2021. Enjoy this studio visit with Eric Hagen. Eric Hagen, welcome to Studio Visits with Silver Eye. Yeah, thank you for having me. Eric, you are the winner of our 2020 uh, Keystone Award, which was juried by Dan Lears, who is the curator of photography at the Carnegie Museum of Art. Um, and the project that you uh, submitted that you won with is called Team Member. And it is about your life working in a, let's call it a upscale grocery chain um, that most people are probably familiar with. I'm personally, I'm really interested in artwork that people make about their working life and their, their everyday life and, and using these kind of, you know, ordinary experiences as an inspiration for, for telling stories about working people. But I think maybe an interesting place to start, if, if you could tell me, you know, why did you start working? Why did you begin working in the grocery store? And, and how did you know it was something you wanted to make artwork about? I think I started working there somewhat by accident, to be honest. Um, I had moved back to the East Coast at that time. I had been living in California for a while, and it just happened to be a job I was able to get easily and ended up just staying with as um, a way to make money. As far as how the idea came to make work about it, somewhat of a back backdrop is that you know prior to this I had driven a taxi for five years in Los Angeles and I had made a body of work based on that experience which happened somewhat um, intuitively I didn't have this like big plan to make work about jobs or labor or anything like that it just happened organically and as far as working at the grocery store I think I had been working there for probably about three years before I had the idea to make work about it. But it just seemed like a, as my work had become more autobiographical um, it, and about my experiences at work, it just seemed like a, a natural extension. Yeah, and, and, and I'll make my confession here as well. Uh, one reason why this project was particularly interesting to me was I also worked in a grocery store for uh, several years in college. And, and so I think one thing that, that really captured me about this project was how much I related to the, that feeling that you capture in so many of these pictures of, I think, a kind of um, exhaustion, a kind of, uh, the kind of relationships you have with your coworkers that begin to percolate uh, in here. Is there an image that, that you could point to as an early image in this project where you began to think about you know, how do you express these feelings about your work through a photograph? Yeah, I think um, probably the earliest image that's still in the project is the the one of me asleep on the table, like in the break room. Um, I had this idea, you know, in terms of thinking about what this work environment is like, all the stores I've worked at, they all have the same kind of break room. It's always in the bowels of the building somewhere or upstairs. It never has windows um, and it's just like this small room that's painted some color that's, you know, supposed to, um, I guess, boost people's spirit. Um, <laughs> but it, 
it you know it's it's actually quite a depressing little room and that's where you get your you know 30 minutes or if that to you know decompress from what goes on in your day um so i think that was the first photo i made that kind of like stuck yeah and you know to me that's an image of exhaustion i, I think to me it, it feels like an image maybe that's almost like outlandish to people who haven't done retail work or service work uh but for people who are familiar with it they they probably will understand that feeling of of kind of midday exhaustion pretty pretty poignantly you know when you began to work in the grocery store what did you i, I guess how did it change you or, or what did you learn about kind of this service retail work that, that you didn't understand before yeah in terms of how it changed me it's a little tough i mean i think i think all jobs tend to uh like rewire you to act in a certain way and and that you even end up taking that home with you um but i think one thing that was uh, specific about this place is that you interact with a lot of people um on a daily basis but the interactions never often don't go beyond like a certain kind of five minute conversation um yeah. and that was definitely something that hadn't really occurred to me so much before i started working there um that you know whether it be with your coworkers or with customers you're often limited to these like little snippets of conversation and you never really go much deeper and it gets quite exhausting to have the same um kind of introductory conversation with 100 people a day so i think that that was something that my eyes were opened up to a little more once i had the job you know yeah you know i think that's something i i really relate to as well that idea of constant barrage of surface level interaction just the kind of emotional work and the emotional exhaustion that that kind of puts you through and you know all these people who you know for you it's your 80th conversation about where to find the parmesan cheese that day and for them it's you know you might be the first person they talk to today <laughs> you know or the, right but you're just coming to those interactions from such separate places i, I think always always caught me off guard. Yeah, and that also, you know, also you become this sort of um wall that people unleash their frustrations on, you know. Um yeah. you know, somebody's having a bad day and the next thing they're yelling at you because their berries got moldy or maybe more recently because they have to wear a mask. That was my next question. So, obviously, you know, we're recording this in January of 2021. originally the show was supposed to open i think a year ago basically and we'll be opening your exhibition this month uh probably still to a limited audience by appointment only because of covid i think one of the things we discussed when we delayed the show was responding to basically how the pandemic has changed your job and changed your life and and eventually changed your the kind of pictures you made tell us how how your working life has changed since you know since march of last year yeah it well it's you know, interesting because there was that sort of one or two month period at the beginning of the pandemic where there was a lot of uh veneration i suppose for what became known as the essential worker suddenly you'd be at work and people were thanking you for coming to work <laughs> <laughs> so it was just kind of like unusual um situation but it it didn't last long and i think the longer uh you know the pandemic has gone on and the more that people have become frustrated by limitations in their life the more those frustrations just again get sort of taken out on uh these people they encounter at this workplace i think in terms of the job itself it's it's just added to the sort of like checklist nature of the day right yeah. where you know you have to in addition to everything that already existed you now have to go through all these cleaning checklists you know it uh, another thing that's interesting is that as online shopping has become for groceries has become more common your your time is actually tracked a lot more because you're now interacting with with an app, right? So 
hmm. if you're shopping someone's order through an app, uh, everything about that can be tracked, how fast you are, the quality of, of what you're doing. Um, so I think that only just adds to the situation of the worker being trapped between one, the sort of like raw desire of the customer being uh, often hurled at them. And then on the other side of every minute of their day being managed by the company. You know, one thing that, that shows up in this project is that that kind of um, those two ends of stress or those two ends of pressure that happen, right? The, the, the management, the company and the customer and kind of you and your coworkers being caught. And, and I think this increasingly pressurized, you know, bind that, that, that's set upon you. You know, one, one photograph I think spoke to that kind of management piece and in, in to me in an interesting way that that had that uh, you know that mix of qualities from from management that I think of as like weirdly optimistic and condescending and like <laughs> we don't even care about the things we're saying like we're you know busy work kind of feeling is this a uh, photo called stack your skills um, which has a bunch of envelopes labeled things like value added and pasta. T tell me about the stack your skills photo and, and you know what those little pockets of papers mean to you. I was interested in it as it, it's sort of like giving this impression that as, as a worker there, you have this kind of like um, agency over you know, what, what you will learn or uh, how you will develop it usually doesn't work out like that, you know? It's, it's kind of weird, because in some ways, yeah, it's, it sort of seems like this like hopeful little thing. Um, but I, I don't actually know if anyone has, has filled one of these out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and even if they did, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think the thing that disturbs me about it is it, it, it almost looks like it's designed for like children. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas if I wanted to say, like, go work in cheese, why couldn't I just go talk to that person? You know, like, right, why do I right. have to fill out this sort of like five uh, special questions about cheese, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, it's like, a, yeah, to me, it just, it really looked like something that was like designed for children to fill out and not adults. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that relationship with, with management seems you know, always struck strikes me within this project as as kind of one that's a little bit, you know, really feels condescending. You know, the, the other aspect that I wanted to talk a little bit, you know, to get back to that COVID piece, and there's just some different ways the project has grown visually. One thing that I found really compelling and, and was, was just a, a fascinating photograph to me was this uh, sample stand picture, which is a telephone on, I, I guess it would be the stand that you would put the, you know, the, the chip samples out on. What does that photo mean to you? Yeah, I, I just was thinking of the ways in which like the space itself has been reformatted for, for COVID, um, you know, often in a very like ad hoc way. Um, so yes, this would be normally where you would get your chips and salsa or your cut up you know, cantaloupe slices, um, but obviously we can't do that anymore. So these stands end up getting repurposed as like a place to put a phone so that you're socially distanced or giant jar of sanitizer. So I was kind of interested in the way that the workspace has kind of been remade a little bit, maybe, maybe a little bit beyond some of the more obvious things that you might see in the front of house as much, you know, like the, the plexiglass, but even in terms of like the back of the house, like how do we repurpose uh, these things we already had to theoretically make a, you know, more safe environment? Yeah, I mean, to me, you know, one thing that's also just kind of haunting about that photo is it, you know, kind of um, mimics the shape of kind of an IV stand, you know, with that uh, telephone cord uh, dangling down, you know, it looks like you know, like hospital-like the way the way so many of the aesthetics in COVID have, have kind of become medicalized. You know, one of the other kind of main genres of photo photos in this project 
are the the pictures of of your coworkers who are not modeling you know you're not shooting in the store itself you're you're building replica break rooms in your studios but they are your actual coworkers correct well it's a it's a mixture um some of them are my actual coworkers and some are friends or even a couple of actors i hired you know i think i think what's important to me is not necessarily are they actually my coworkers or not like in terms of how it's read but are they are they believable <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, do, do do you like, is it believable that this is a person, or, you know, a photograph of a person on their break? Yes, I have brought my coworkers in as well. But um, I think what's, as long as it's believable that that was what was more important to me, um, yeah. because it's not, it's not a documentary project, you know, it's not, they are staged. Um, so as long as a person could sort of get into that role, then, then I could work with other people. I think originally I was, I was also very like hesitant to use people that, that I worked with just because mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was crossing some sort of weird work, non-work life boundary. And now that we've entered COVID, it actually seemed to make more sense to photograph people I work with because theoretically I'm already exposed to them. No, I think I think it was important to use myself as one of the subjects, though, um, just because I do think of the work as being, you know, autobiographical to a large extent. It, mm -hmm. you know, it is based very much on my own experience, um, and you know, I do hope other people relate to it. But so it did it did seem important that I was one of the people photographed. Tell me about the process of building the sets for the for the photographs of the break room. I mean, what what is important? You know, how, what was important to you in kind of capturing the aesthetic of these, of these kind of strange spaces? I tr tried to probably strip it down a little. I mean, like I said, there is some ubiquity to these spaces, no matter which store I've been in. So I tried to like work with these specific colors um, that I've either seen or that seemed like I could imagine them in these spaces. The rest of it, I, it's like I tried to make it almost a facsimile but if it's you know if it also looks a little staged that's okay and i tried to just you know think about like well what do people eat on their break and you know like <laughs> what what you know what is that what do they do on their break like how do they how do they pass the time right so you know it's like you maybe have time to eat something small you probably catch up on stuff on your phone uh maybe you read like 10 pages of a book um but yeah there's not a lot of time um, yeah. You might try to take like a quick nap. So yeah, I tried to build the sets to be to be mostly realistic, but also I think like pretty stripped down. I had been looking a lot when I first started doing this at this painter, David Bird, who worked for like 30 years in the VA hospital in New York. And he did all these kind of like amazing paintings that were based on his work. And they were often just like these figures and these like really... Uh, simple stripped down spaces with like, you know, like sort of a one color wall. So I was kind of thinking about that work a little bit, you know, when I was constructing these. And I think pe people who, when people would come to, to sit for the photographs, they, they were always kind of like amused because they would just come to this little, you know, uh, eight foot by eight foot break room set with probably some already half eaten food on the table for them to um, <laughs> be with. So it was always a bit amusing when people would come over. How have your coworkers uh, who have seen the project, how have they responded to it? I think very positively. <laughs> I mean, um, I, th I think, well, I think they, they get it, which is very heartening to me you know that they like identify with it or relate to it but yeah in terms of people who I've given copies of the book to or who have you know seen the work to some extent um I think largely they they absolutely understand what it's about um so I wanted to talk to you about a, a huge component of the of the book and and the exhibition and I think that the project overall which we haven't gotten to yet is the, the the written text pieces that you've added. 
And there's a number of different kinds of text you're incorporating into this project. Uh, but I think it's all really very poetic and very, um, really helps to tell these stories of your daily experiences. So I wanted to start just, uh, if, if, if you allow me just to read one of the texts that, that I really love from the book um, that, that accompanies this photo of, of these rotting raspberries that you've made that's really a beautiful kind of detail of this, this mold kind of growing on a container of raspberries. And, and the text that you've written, which seems to kind of be an exchange uh, for, with you and the customer, and it starts, they went bad. I nodded a kind of confirmation, squinting and pursing my lips. I looked down at the white mold spreading over the berries and then over at the woman. I wondered if she had ever read any Walt Whitman. It may be if I had known them, I would have loved them. I said, I could hear her staring. I guess that was a no. I started processing her refund on the computer. Returns, return transactions, scan item, reason for return, product condition, method of refund, cash. Dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. Oh, I perceive, after all, so many uttering tongues, and I perceive they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. We made eye contact as I recited the last line. The moment was interrupted by the sound of the register drawer popping open. I looked at the screen, change due, 399. I counted out four singles. Do you have a penny? I mean, it's 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 a uh, it's such a <laughs> it's such a uh, strange <laughs> moment, <laughs> you know, a funny moment. Was this a real moment, or is this kind of a, a a little bit of a fantasy in your head? Yeah, it's it's more of a fantasy in my head. I mean, I I didn't actually recite the <laughs> a, a modified version of uh, Leaves of Grass to this customer, but. Um, <laughs> But I, I, it, but those are kind of, it's, it's more like a, what kind of absurd things run through your mind when you just, you know, doing these repetitive tasks over and over. And those are just, I do have thoughts like that. I might not say it, but it, it's kind of like running through my head as a backdrop, you know, somewhat in my day. I think with the text, it's interesting. When I first started the work, it was, it kind of went all different directions. I, I really didn't know where to go with it. A lot of the early pieces I made, I found that people didn't really respond to. But I noticed when I told stories about my job or stories about interactions with customers or with like management, people really responded to those. So I just thought, well, I guess I can just write them. <laughs> you know, I, and, <laughs> I mean, I think once I actually started the writing, that kind of like, is really what brought it to the place it's at now. Mm. Like a lot of the images that are here now came after the writing portion, actually. Like that really reformed the project because it, it gave me a way to sort of include interactions or the fantasies or just like absurd ideas that I didn't feel I could, you know, express with just the photographs. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. If you'll permit me to read one more, uh, this is a passage I really love because it gets to the idea of abundance. And it also, I think, really shows your sense of humor in this project. It goes, every month, Overnight Grocery builds little shrines at the end of each aisle, a tower of beans, a ziggurat of cage-free chicken broth, an ode to fair trade beef jerky, and day by day, as all the hands of the shopping public pass by, this juice or that chip starts to disappear, and you'd swear those hands belong to David Blaine, all that high pH water slowly vanishing into the cul-de-sacs of Long Island. <laughs> I mean, they're also just funny, too. Like, you know, I think the, they, they bring in a, oftentimes they bring in a sense of humor, which I think is is present in the photos, but but not as not as tangible as it is when you're writing. Yeah, I, no, I definitely think that's where I get a chance to express my humor <laughs> is in the writing. <laughs> um, and it, it kind of, I, you know, again, I hope it sort of works in conjunction with the photographs, which um, maybe are a little bit uh, darker, you know, as um, that those two things can like work hand in hand. 
Um, and there's another element, you know, one that, that that's really present in the book and, and one that is interesting to me as well, which are, are all these found pieces of writing. And, and I think they're mostly grocery lists that you're finding in the store. Can you tell me about, about the, the lists and, you know, where you're finding them and, and what's compelling about them to you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. That's actually another one of like the earlier pieces of the project that I developed that has has stayed with it, um, which was finding, uh, you know, most of them are shopping lists, but some of them are just like other uh, notes people left for each other or some other sorts of found papers. And usually I would just either find them on the ground or like in an empty shopping cart, like people just discarded them there or dropped them. I think I became interested in them as a, a, again, as like a way to sort of describe what this place was, you know, it, okay, it's a shopping list immediately, you know, it's a grocery store based on the shopping list, but just all these other like little details of people's lives on the list about other obligations they had in their personal life or owing somebody money, um, <laughs> you know, or even just what's like the stationery on them, you know, like the, the FM home loans, it's, it, you know, it might speak to again, like where, where is this place exist? It's kind of like in the suburbs maybe, or, you know, so it, yeah, again, I just thought of them as a way to not only sort of get in maybe into the minds a little bit of the people who left them behind, but to give it context of what this place was. Yeah, I mean that, you know, to me, just the the different handwriting and the, you know, it it, it makes the the customers uh, more of a tangible character, just like the stories that do as well. You know, and, and, and the customers are never really in the photographs that you make, right? That they're the, the photographs all tend to be about the the working people. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's that's absolutely the case. I mean, I I think, you know, earlier on, I had tried to like figure out a way visually to either bring in like the sort of corporate side of it or the the customer side of it a little more. But you know, at the end, it, it really is focused on the workers' experience. So it, in terms of the images, it really I think focuses in a little more on that because that's where I'm situated in the equation. And that's mm -hmm. the experience like I want to talk about, you know, is what, what is the experience to work in this place? You know, in the States, one of the most common, you know, uh, low wage jobs is working in retail. Um, and I definitely think that consumers or customers, you know, at a certain point forget that it, those are people. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Because their, their focus, you know, the, as, a, as a customer, they often identify the, the people who work at, at these kind of places as, as the company, right? Mm -hmm. So any frustrations they have with X company, they often take out on the workers who really have no say over, you know, what I, you know, I, I have kind of a, a funny question, and, I, and I'm not even sure how to ask it, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot uh, when I've been thinking about this project over the last couple of days. And are you proud of the work you do ever or in any way? Or, or is it just a thing that is just a job? I mean, I think, um, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think like I as much as I dislike my job, I, I try to do well at it, you know? <laughs> um, but I, I think maybe I, I try to do that more for the, the other workers around me, you know, than I do for say the customers or for the company. I, you know, I don't, this is maybe isn't directly answering your question, but uh, you know, I was thinking to back when the, the pandemic started and um you know, there was uh, a number of, or some companies, the, there was like a lot of organizing you would see online that everyone should take a, a sick out. Basically like people shouldn't come into work one day to sort of protest uh, getting a higher wage. And, um, you know, some people I knew asked me if I was, people who don't work where I work, you know, maybe people who are, work more in the art world or media world were like, oh, are you gonna participate in this? And I was like, no <laughs> and i think they were i think at first people felt a little bit like well you know why wouldn't you that you know it's sort of like about 
solidarity, you know, and it's like, yeah, but really the only person who would suffer at the end of the day is me and my, the other people I work with each day, um, because there's one less person there to, when we're already probably shorthanded, right? You know, so, mm-hmm. so it, it's, it, that kind of, um, sort of change can't be on the on the back of the worker like i'm expendable <laughs> you know? like, like if i if i if i uh protest out in front of the store over wages i'm just gonna get fired and nobody's gonna blink an eye about it you know and so really again i i get it i guess it just goes back to being like the reason i try hard at work or you know take some sense of pride in my work is just in order to hope that it it's it's as people who work together we can help each other i I think that's a a nice spot to wrap up and i'll just i'll wrap up just by saying uh thank you so much for for sharing this work with us today and we're really looking forward to having it in the gallery this spring yeah i'm I'm excited and um thank you to um, you and kate both and also to uh dan lear for this um i'm excited to see in the gallery so